then you have like multiple <laughs> levels of that. Um, we're live now, by the way, Andy, <laughs> as we talk about our, listen, for us, those of you joining us, before we get to AI and content marketing, we're talking about double chins and how to minimize that on screen. So if anyone has any best practices around this, is it camera angle? Or is it just, I think it might, Andy, just be like less carbs. It might just be. Yeah, like there's a lifestyle this. decision that I've made that, or just don't stop aging. I don't know how that, yeah. I don't know how that works either. Well, anyway, um, <laughs> welcome Ooh. everybody. I'm super excited you're here. As I mentioned in the in the chat a few, a couple minutes ago, we had over 600 people sign up hmm. for this session. No pressure, Andy. Like everyone's super excited. Um Great. Uh, about this session, about this topic. I know you gave a version of this presentation at Content Marketing World. It was uh, very well received. It was one of the highest rated sessions that they had down there. Mm -hmm. So excited to do this today. Camera slightly up is what I'm seeing. I get Carrie Sanderson says that if you if you get your camera high enough, camera slightly from above. I think I need mm -hmm. to work on that because this is just sitting on top of my monitor and maybe I need to like prop it up. Take, should I tape it? I don't know. We're not, I'm already off track. So great. listen, yeah. um, Welcome everybody who is here. Uh, thank you everyone who is uh, saying hi uh, from wherever you are. Would love to hear from you, who you are, where you're calling in from, where you're joining us. We have the ability to throw people up on screen. So for example, hi, Lisa. Lisa from Boulder, Colorado. Hi, Matt and Andy, excited to see you here. Uh, excited to see a lot of names, Beth, Mark, Carrie, a bunch of folks that know well and excited that you're all joining us today. A um, couple quick housekeeping things that I'm going to get out of the way and uh, and let Andy present today. So, uh, yes, this is being recorded. Yes, you will get an on-demand version of this if you want to watch it again. Yes, the slides are included in a content package follow-up that you'll all get within 24 hours or so of the end of the webinar. Um, Andy may or may not walk through the entire deck he did at Social Media Marketing World. Um, but he will have the whole deck for you in the follow-up. So you'll get everything you want. Um, thank you, Todd. I'm a fan of my hairstyle as well. You don't have, listen, you save money with this. You don't ever have to buy shampoo ever again, uh, but uh, welcome everybody. All right, no further ado, I am going to be here for comic relief, obviously, as well as to sort of watch the chat, to ask questions, to dive deeper into certain topics. But Andy, um, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here. Maybe give a quick for maybe the one or two out of 600 people that don't know you, quick introduction of yourself, and then we're off to the races. Uh, Co-founder of Orbit Media, uh, a digital agency totally focused on websites, web development, website optimization. Started in 2001, so I've been doing some of these things for a very long time. Search optimization, analytics, uh, content marketer since 2007, so lots of publishing, recording, speaking at events. Uh, and then... Uh, AI for me has become a, a, a shorter path or a faster, more efficient way to help people do some of the things that I've done every day for years. Many of the things that I'm going to do today are things that just I would do anyway, even without an AI. Uh, others are sort of AI specific and there's advantages that um, I'm happy to share. Uh, and I'll say briefly, and he's going to be uh, uh, uncomfortable by this, but I am a Matt fan from way back and Orbit is a Heinz client. Um, I didn't know all the gaps in my fundamental kind of go-to-market strategy. Uh, I didn't have documented ICPs. Uh, people think it's crazy when they hear that I hired an agency. I hired an agency, and I'm having a fantastic uh, experience working with Matt's team at, at Heinz. Thank so you. enough of that. I had to put it in there. <laughs> okay. I'm going to jump in. I'm going to share my uh, my screen, entire screen. I think that that screen, share, present, wrong screen. One second. Share. <laughs> Stop share, present, share screen. I just tested this a second ago. Entire screen, it's going to be this screen. Share and present. Okay. There you go. Yep, here we are. Right. Uh, it's a presentation, so I need an example. I picked an example. My example is a spacecraft, space launch services company. Uh, we are going to be a spaceport for the next 40 some minutes, and our target audience is commercial satellite operators. Why not? These Methods are applicable to any business. Nothing that special about, I, I just have, I picked one. Uh, this is what I see all over. I read articles that say, they, they use this one simple prompt and it'll solve all your problems. I think that's absurd. That's a very lazy prompt, uh, very unlikely to give you anything that's highly differentiated. These are just generic off target things, right? People who write these things like write an article about satellite launch best practices. That's a lazy prompt. And the article it gives you is not going to be, it's not going to stand out. It's not going to 
it's not going to put a dent in your in your you know pipeline. This is not impressive to me. That's boring. It's obvious. And I joke that if you if that's how you're using AI, you should have low expectations because AI just consumed the internet and it comes back and gives you sort of the average of everything it read. I joke that AI stands for average information. <laughs> Basically, what it's doing. It read 85% of the internet and it distilled it down and it gives you kind of the average based on what little thing you, you know, the 10 words you typed in as a prompt. We can do better than that. That tastes like water. We're going to get better than that. And, and I'm going to go through a bunch of these methods today. I'm not, I, I might not do them all, but you're going to get, these slides are super prescriptive. They show you sort of exactly how to go through each method. Um, some of these are basically training the AI to kind of be like your audience. And others of these are training the AI to be like you. In my mind, that's the two ways we use AI. And there's some data analysis, maybe a third application, but mostly it's about getting doing better empathy and, and getting it on, the, on brand. So training it to be like the audience, training it to be like you. Uh, a lot of people, their goal is to use AI to become more efficient. That's fine. Uh, I don't really care about efficiency as much as I care about quality. Um, so I'm really looking for a more comprehensive output, um, because in my experience, there's a tiny percentage of things that get the great uh, proportion of results, and I will do anything possible to move even a little bit farther over on this chart, right? Because those few outperformers get not, you know, the, like a hundred X outcome. It's absurd how much more effective some things are than others. There are no straight lines in digital performance, right? A tiny percentage of social accounts get most of the traction. A tiny percentage of search optimized articles get most of the clicks. A tiny percentage of pages on your website get most of the visits. Like it's just every everything you look at in digital, if you look at it, it's not actually on a, not a logarithmic scale. So let's just be farther over there. I will put in 10X efforts every time because I know that that's how I'm gonna get 100X results. 20% efficiency is fine, but uh, that's not really what I'm doing here today, you'll see. Step one. I can call this step zero. The first thing, the main thing, the, old, the, the the most effective thing is to first teach it who we're talking to so that it can give us responses that are specific to us. So I call this the persona prompt. I'm going to deconstruct it for you. I could share these as text if you want to just copy and paste it. I have a shared prompt library with these like kind of all laid out. Um, it sounds like this. Build me a persona of a job title, commercial satellite operator, of an industry and company size, billion dollar global telecom, it's a medium sized global telecom, Respo uh, with responsibilities and challenges, they're launching satellites, and they have certain needs and requirements. Deploy communication satellites, considering new launch service providers. And what do I want from the AI? Give me the hopes, the dreams, the fears, the concerns, the emotional triggers, and their decision criteria for selecting a satellite launch services company, right? I want to know how they buy. I want to know what they think about, right? Matt's probably interested in this, right? You get the idea, like, why wouldn't they buy? What do they care about? What is their what is their zero moment of truth, right? What sent them looking? What's the true story in the life of my prospect? Because my success depends entirely on me connecting with them in that moment. The response, probably inaccurate. And that's fine. Don't trust AI. <laughs> that's a mistake. Assume it's wrong and then fix it. I actually showed this. I mean, I think that actually looks pretty good. I'm not a satellite operator, but... Uh, I show this to my, Matt, you probably know her, Ardeth Albee, mm -hmm. persona expert, literally decades of just doing this, done it for hundreds of companies, right? She, her definition of a persona is a format for making your buyer insights actionable. I love her. So I showed this to her on a call. I'm like, Ardeth, prove me wrong. What's wrong with that? I'm going to show you what I'm doing. I want you to poke holes in it. And she said, is that accurate? You didn't check that. Is that your, is that, you know, you have to She's check here, by the way, uh, Andy. So uh... Ardeth. Yes. Thank you. You are correct. And I'm learn and I learn from you every time we, we talk. Uh, I am a fan of this thinking and I show this slide every time I talk about AI and personas because I don't trust it and I and I don't think anyone should trust it. Check it. That's her point. That's that's what Ardeth is teaching us. So I check it and I look at it, and even five minutes of research, I learn like, wait a minute, this global sat this operator, this satellite operator cares about. Insurance and risk management, <laughs> of course they do. They, they, they've spent millions of dollars on a satellite. They don't want it to blow up on the launch pad. They care about, they might want ride share opportunities. They care about geopolitics. Okay, so then you go tell the AI to fix it. Or you did good ones. You hired Ardeth. Just hire Ardeth and give it, and, and when you take that, you can upload it to AI. And now the responses should be better. 
I'm still not going to trust it completely, but my responses should be better. And I can do all kinds of things with it. I can ask it questions day or night. I don't have to schedule a call. I can like pretend I've got a synthetic member of my audience that I can just get a perspective, right? That's all I'm looking for is another, another, another input. What information would help you do your job? What social posts might you click on? What key phrases might you search for? What research studies could I, could I create that would support your content? You know, how, how could my content program help you do your job? And by the way, what do you hate about looking for companies like mine, right? It is very useful to have, uh, you know, you could build like an AI panel or an AI persona or uh, just someone to like bounce things off of, or uh, you'll see everything that I'm going to do now is based on that persona. I do not use AI to do research or, you know, content marketing support until I have trained it on the persona. I think that's a mistake. It's a foolish mistake. If you do this and you like it and it works, you can copy and paste it out of there, share it with your team. They can upload that every time they use AI. Or if you're kind of a solo, you know, mostly solo marketer, I mostly am. It's just me and Amanda here. Uh, I save that and I'm going to use that every time, Make keep improving it over time. Now we're ready to move on. A little different, right? But not not the uh, short, simple, lazy prompt. I think that's, uh, I'm, I'm trying to make this, uh, it, it, marketing for me has always been data-driven empathy. And that's exactly what I'm doing here. Um, taking it all with a grain of salt, but starting by teaching it at my audience. Next, what does this person want? That, by the way, is the most useful, mo the most common use of AI with marketers right now. This is our blogging survey. It's, several, it's months old now, but generate ideas. There's other research that suggests this. Generate ideas is the main thing that marketers are doing with AI. That is the number one use case for, for marketers in AI right now, brainstorming. So first, a multi-step process. My next step is to just ask it what, what information it needs. You're sort of the content marketers constantly asking like, what are this, what does my audience's unmet information needs on this page, in this article, in their life? You're a content expert, you're a content strategist, you're skilled in selecting topics. What information does the commercial satellite operator, see I'm in that same conversation. What do they need to do their job? And then it comes back and it gives me some topic ideas, some of which I don't wanna talk about at all, not even, you know, not aligned with my content strategy. Others may be very well aligned. See that filtering process, that extra step to first figure out what their information needs are and then proceed, right? Gonna give me a far better output. Is This is maybe a longer process than you were expecting. I'm not using short, simple prompts. I'm taking a multi-step approach and, and look, looking closely at this all the time. I trust people. I trust you. I trust you and your brain. I don't trust AI. I have to go through these steps and exclude the garbage that's irrelevant. I like that one. Now I'm going to ask it to suggest topics. Suggest 10 articles on this topic. They'll capture the interest of the persona, provide practical utility, make them compelling, make them memorable. My goal is really to be top of mind. I, I throw in words in these that you might not, might be unexpected to you, but steal them all if, if you like them. You might find your own words that you use to get better prompts or to kind of focus on that outcome you're looking for. Make them compelling, make them memorable. Hear that? See that with those words, it matters. And then I just copy and paste in one of those, one of their information needs. And what it comes back with, far more likely to be useful to me, right? Key indicators of launch failures, bridging communication gaps, ground control to major risk. I love that. That's a, that's David, that's a David Bowie reference, I think, right? <laughs> Gen X, yeah. Gen X, who's with me? Okay. So what I just did was I started with the persona, then I talked to the persona about its information needs, and then I looked for topics. Andy, real quick, Joe has a question. Are you in chat GPT-4 or what, what we're using for this? Everything I just did, you can do using chat GPT 3.5, the free mm -hmm. version. Uh, I pay $20 a month, which I think is a low price for some of the most powerful technology devised by humans. <laughs> I have I had a, a, a $15 cocktail on Saturday. I get more value for my $20 a month in using chat GPT plus than I, than I got from that cocktail. Uh, I think it's worth 20 bucks. Uh, I tell people on my team, please don't try to save $20. If you can get access to a tool that's several of the things I'll do next, you actually need to pay that because I want to upload files and upload screenshots. I'm going to do an analysis for which you have to have a ChatGPT Plus account to have it like draw charts for you. And up, you know, if you make that persona a PDF that you love, and uh, I think you need the Plus account to be able to upload files. Anyway, uh, but I'm not using anything fancy. I'm not paying 
$500 a month for like a fancy AI tool. Uh, I'm quite successful, by the way, by ignoring AI tools. Mm -hmm. uh, there's three AI startups launching per day. Uh, I, uh, people send me these things all the time. Uh, I'm just focusing on a simple, vanilla, accessible, everyone knows it. You probably already have an account method. If I was here showing you how to use an $800 a month content marketing, you know, ideation research tool, it wouldn't be as useful to you. Mm -hmm. So my content strategy sort of pushes me toward keeping it simple for you. Okay, next, speaking of content strategy, content marketing mission statement, this email sign up CTA. Uh, brands that do this and have a documented content mission are more likely to report results. Uh, yet most brands have not done this. Only 28% of us have a documented content mission statement. I don't know why you wouldn't do that. I find it easy and fun to do. I do it with friends at bars. I will do it for, I'd do it with any of you if we were hanging out um, uh, over one of those overpriced cocktails. This is my template for that. Uh, it's in a, I wrote a book that this is like a big part of it. Uh, you just fill in these blanks and you have the foundation for your content strategy. Audience X, information Y, benefit Z. Now, if I want AI's help with that, I have to teach it what a content marketing mission statement is like. And so the prompt is a bit detailed. It says a mission statement includes these elements, audience, topics, benefit to the reader. It should be concise and adaptable as a call to action, draft a content mission statement for the persona. See, I'm always in that same prompt, that same conversation. And give me three examples for a newsletter sign up CTA. So it uh, that's what I asked it for. It's a, most of my prompts, maybe they're like this. Give it the best practices for the asset you wanted to create a draft for. Uh, do it in the persona prompt, and then um, when you you know tell it its skills. I don't think this is terrible. Uh, read that sign up CTA. Stay ahead with the latest insights on launch risks, tech trends, and best practices. That's actually better than a lot of people's email sign up CTAs. I see this all the time. Stay up to date. Subscribe. What? Why would anybody do that? That's a terrible email sign up CTA. You didn't tell them what they're going to get or how often you didn't show any proof points for it. So uh, I think that's a good starting point and a useful a useful prompt uh, just to get ideas. You know, there's only one small part of that that I liked and 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 and, and took. Again, 80% of what I get in my responses, I'm just ignoring because it's not aligned. That's fine, right? It's like a, it's just an assistant for me. Okay, next up, thought leadership. My definition of thought leadership is that is strong opinion. It's taking a stand. It's when people don't follow ideas unless that idea is uh, sort of, uh, you know, planting a flag, right? Drawing, a, you know, coming out for and against something. Um, there's research that showed, Steve Rayson did research that showed, I'll paraphrase, the content that gets the best results in search and social, we'll say, you know, shares and links, uh, are strong opinion and original research. These are the two highly differentiated formats for content marketing. In all my years in a content marketing role, like in producing content for Orbit, I know that these are ones, I can see it in my metrics, like these are the ones that get the much, much better results. I did this recently. I'm gonna edge the line, come close to, to strong opinion with the recent piece that I did, which basically um, uh, took a stand on these are things that you should not put on a website. I made the case like PDF, uh, PDFs are the rust of the internet. You shouldn't have PDFs on a website or press releases don't belong on websites. Press releases are not digital content best practices. What's a for immediate release? What? Instead of what? That little weak little about section at the bottom, it's absurd. Like, why do people post? Like, so I'm basically coming out. It's a pretty mundane topic, what to take off your website, but uh, it's still like a strong assertion the way that the tone that I used. And people have strong opinions on very mundane topics. Thought leadership doesn't mean, you know, social justice and geopolitics, you know, you might get greater engagement talking about like the Oxford comma. I'm not even kidding. Like <laughs> all of you yeah. just had thoughts when I said Oxford comma, right? Everyone's got an opinion on that. Uh, so I'm going to show you now how to use AI to help you find topics for thought leadership that are, uh, you know, not going to be, you know, sort of little hand grenades for your audience. Here's a video I made on that topic. I took that video of me making that case, including me recommending that you remove dates from your blog. I recommended removing dates from your blog and I posted this on YouTube. And what happened next was a lot of engagement on that topic. A lot of people disagreed with me. 
uh, but that's actually what Seth Godin says thought leadership is. Thought leadership should create, it always creates tension. It's about making assertions. You have to be willing to be wrong. If you can't disagree with it, it's not thought leadership. I loved when he told me this. I was in the front row of a session he taught and I raised my hand first and I had to ask this question. He was clearly excited to talk about it. So the comments were just like very, like, look, sleazy, untrustworthy. I hate cap, all caps. Look at that response. All caps, the word hate. I hate with an article has no date. Now, this guy just said, I'm told people to make useless websites. Do not remove the date in all caps. This is terrible advice. Look, she didn't even watch it. My beautiful health did not watch it. She, the comments were enough to tell her it was bad. Please dude, give me a chance. My no, goodness. no, no. Don't remove dates. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. How about letting an experienced UX designer do the talking? I've been part of the planning process for more than 1,000 websites in 24 years. I have thought quite a bit about this. I got some data if you care to. None of these people, by the way, are, are showing data. They're 100% opinions, which I it's And they're not speaking from the half. Uh, they're all speaking on behalf of the reader, not the marketer. Anyway, uh, some of the comments were positive, of course, which I appreciated. Uh, this guy said that I look like Joseph <laughs> Gordon-Levitt. YouTube is a rough place, man. That's oh a gosh. bad neighborhood. I don't dye my hair. Why does that like? Yeah, the guy says I use wow. hair dye. I know. Mm. Yeah, but then look what happens. But at the, when I took the screenshot, I had 170,000 views. It's more. It's past 200,000 now. That's Why? Crazy. Because YouTube wants engagement, and I mm -hmm. made an assertion in the ad. I triggered the algorithm to show that these are all from browse and suggested, right? That is 100x my typical, more than that, right? Most of my videos get like maybe 500 or 800 or maybe 1,000 views. Okay, so the point here is that ChatGPT cannot throw a punch. It has no perspective. You have opinions. It does not, right? But ChatGPT can help you find provocative topics. This is so fun. I highly recommend this. Look at this prompt. What are some relatively mundane, almost trivial space industry topics that professionals have very strong opinions about? The answer is units of measurement, naming conventions, how to name celestial bodies. I totally want to, I'm, I'm, I'm also interested. I'm not even a commercial satellite operator, right? So this is my provocative yet mundane topic research prompt that I'll, you should all try. And it'll give you a bunch of stuff, ignore most of it, but you'll find one in there that might make a great topic and just catnip for your audience on social media. Don't be at all surprised, right? Space debris management and data sharing. Here's my thought leadership prompts. They're not, they're, they're prompts that trigger topics that may be useful to you in the context of strong strong assertions. What, what are people in my industry afraid to answer? What false things do people think are true? What are the most common assertions that people that are least likely to be supported by evidence? That's a really great prompt. If, if you learn that in your category, there's some things that people often say, but rarely support with evidence, and you publish that missing statistic, that's like PR gold. Anybody can do original research, right? It, you don't need to be super rigorous. It's marketing content anyway. But there are frequently asserted, rarely supported things in every industry. Find and publish that missing stat. This is gap analysis. I do lots of gap analysis with AI, but this is gap analysis on an entire internet. What are the most important topics in our industry that are the least likely to be covered by the big blogs? It'll tell you what's missing from all the blogs in your industry. I love that. The humans actually can't do that. Um, what counter narrative opinions about this topic are the least likely to be discovered, uh, discussed by thought leaders? Counter narrative opinions, that is a, um, it's just, I mean, these things cost nothing to type in, right? Just give it a try, see what it says. It, it might trigger some great, great ideas. And when I did that here, it gave me some ideas, right? These are counter narrative opinions. These are assertions that are least likely to be supported. And I take, and I find some of these that are maybe interesting Maybe I can cover them. Next, I'm going to have it make an outline. I don't just ask it to write an article. First, I've got the persona. Then I've got ideas about counter-narrative opinions and, and poorly supported assertions. And then I can have it write an outline. You're a content strategist. You're skilled in crafting detailed, memorable articles that delight commercial satellite operators. Write an outline for an article on the following topic. Bridging communication gaps. Here, I copied that from above, right? I'm just moving it down. And that highlight some sections that will give me the opportunity to cover these assertions and to discuss counter narratives. And uh, the next thing it comes back with might be useful. 
Might not be, but might be useful. If so, scan down, fix it, change it, improve it. Of course it wasn't perfect, but it gave me a place to, to inject these you know, uh, strong assertions. Uh, it actually does a good job. It's a great idea to include like mini case studies inside your piece. Um, you know, so as, as always, take that with a grain of salt, edit it, rip it apart, take the three good things, throw away the rest, whatever. You know, you're the content strategist. It's just a support tool, right? It's just giving you kind of a shortcut to, to an outline. It's just another input. Here I am using many of these like AI stands for what? Another input. That's all it is. It's not a magical, you know, uh, it's not magic that's going to replace you someday. You need to do your job still. <laughs> if you're worried about labor market impact, this should be comforting. <laughs> the fact that it's not perfect. It's funny that some of the same people that think it can do everything with a few simple words are also the people that are um, don't like it because they think it's going to steal their job. Really, it, it, it can't even come close. Like this is just a tool. Anyway. Uh, if what's useful or not, it's up to you. Okay, Matt, I sort of feel like skipping this right the first draft. Uh, I don't even do this. I write everything by hand personally. Uh, I'll, I'll click through quick. Um, Lisa is here, Lisa Adams, and, and she's better at this than me. This is a custom GPT. Click on Explore GPTs, give us some general instructions, and upload tons of your content that you wrote. That's called its knowledge sources, and you give it all of those things. And once it has a lot of samples of your writing, then uh, that that becomes a, you know, you save that, and that's a little, um, should be able to write on brand and using your tone of voice. Um, voice and tone should be accurate now because I, I just uploaded 100 articles to it. I, it took me a long time. Put all those articles into giant PDFs and then gave it all of that stuff. And then uh, if I give it the, the persona, and if I give it the outline, uh, right now it should be able to write an article in my voice. I trained it on, on my audience, used the audience for ideation, uh, found gaps in research, found assertions, had it write an outline. But I'm not going to even pretend it can write an article like me until I've trained it on my writing by giving it, by uploading a large amount of uh, my, they call it your elbow, your lifetime body of work. Take all your best stuff from your website, grab as much of your elbow as you can. Put it in PDFs, upload it to the to a custom GPT, and then it's much more likely to write something that's a bit on point. Look, it's got bullet points, it's got um, subheads. A lot of this stuff is, I can tell it's learned from the training data. Uh, not sufficient. It's not done, of course. You have the subsequent prompts if you wanted to try them. Expand, add detail, use less jargon, use shorter words. Uh, which areas do I need to better support? Suggest examples. What areas need visuals? Suggest examples. What subject matter experts should I include? This, by the way, you're always going to have, well, I should never never say always, but uh, probably we're going to always need to take whatever it gave us and add those critical success factors on good content. Images, video, contributor quotes from from SMEs, subject uh, specific examples from your, your uh, from your clients, your work. Supportive data, internal links. It doesn't know that. It can't do that. Strong opinions, right? It doesn't have friends, so it doesn't know your subject matter expert buddies. It doesn't have a, a point of view, so you have to add the opinions, right? It doesn't have a face, so you've got to add, you know, that video summary that you gave it. And those things, I'll flip that. It's very easy to differentiate your content from AI because these are things that just AI can't do. I love this quote. This is Jay Bear. Oops, I need to put his name down. That's Jay Bear. He says, the problem is not that AI does what marketers can do. The problem is that marketers keep doing what it can be done by an AI. So how do you separate your content from AI? Here's a simple example uh, from last year. I say, I think, so I know that that was right before the cutoff date for GA for Universal. So I knew right when I was publishing this, that that was the perfect time. That was my knowledge of my audience. Uh, I wrote this sentence that says, GA4 is better than universal analytics. Yeah, I can't write that sentence. It does not have an opinion. I actually believe that to be true. I know that it's not a popular opinion. I think GA4 is a very powerful tool and I get value from it every day. The, me explaining this in my voice, it can't do that. And then uh, the visual summary, it can't do that, right? I'm comparing universal analytics is always kind of like IKEA. GA4 is like Home Depot. You can build all kinds of cool stuff. 
And then it doesn't have my friends. I reach out to my crankiest friends and ask them for their point of view. And they come back and like, this tool is garbage. They think, you know, they, it's still in beta. Why did they release this? Right. These are points of view. Look at these people. They're very passionate about this. AI can't write that article. It doesn't know them. AI doesn't have their points of view. This is extremely differentiated content, right? That when you read it, you know, in a world of AI generated content, don't worry. You're going to have no trouble differentiating yourself if you just put these things in there. Take a stand, collaborate with others, you know, and then, uh, you know, hit record. Moving on, moving on. Uh, this I can also do very briefly. There's a lot of, you know, we create, promote measure, create, promote measure all day, every day. That's the job of the content marketer. So uh, on the promotion piece, there are helpful, there are helpful things. Uh, you don't really have to write promotional emails for an article anymore. This is a newsletter, for example, your article is going to be on, you know, living on your blog and the email has a call to action to send people there. Uh, you just give it the article and ask it in that style or use your custom GPT, write an email promoting that article, be concise, add a bullet list. And it wrote a nice one. And then I, to test this, I'm a data-driven marketer. I put both of them there, one that I wrote by hand and one that AI wrote and sent them uh, to see if there was any difference. This is a tiny, tiny data set. It's one email, but there's really no difference. I'm not surprised. Uh, Matt and I are both friends with Ann Handley. Ann would say, your subject line is not as important as your from name, right? People open email because they trust that brand or that person sending them email. So... Weirdly, uh, we did a webinar last night with uh, uh, an email pro, uh, Jay uh, Schwendelman, Schwendelson. It was so good. Anyway, he um, uh, he went through all these little things that can affect open rates. But at the end, we we were talking about how it's really about the relationship and trust. You, know, you get an email from Ann, you open it. Who cares what the sender, what the subject line says? Um, so. Go ahead if it saves you time, because that's kind of a lower stakes thing than you might think. Similarly, AI for social media. Um, I'm going to do some analysis here first, because I think that's not everybody is familiar with that yet. Uh, I'm in LinkedIn. I'm super active in LinkedIn. So there's more data here. You could use this for any channel. You could use it for Google Analytics. But I'm going to take data out uh, by going to a, 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 the tool, the analytics, go to a long date range, click export. And it gives me this big, messy spreadsheet of all of my LinkedIn posts when they were published in the dates. The column A and column A are the same. It's kind of a disaster. So I manually clean this up. Structured data is what we're looking for. And because of AI and these export buttons, I get excited whenever I see an export button. Some tools will export more structured data than others. LinkedIn is not good for structured data. <laughs> this was not structured data. Uh, GA4, not great. Uh, SEMrush, okay. Uh, Google Search Console, very good. Like there's different tools. I have a new perspective on tools because some have a much cleaner export. And when I can export data, if you have permission, you know, be careful, check your legal policies, don't upload your client data. Some people are very squeamish about this. Um, it's This is my own data and I'm not concerned. Uh, uh, use a tool where you know it's you're, it's all sequestered Right, like an Azure instance, or there's ways to use AI that are completely separate where you're not training ChatGPT5. But anyway, so after you know a long you know Sunday morning, I get all this organized in here, and I've got the link to the to the post, the published date, the post text. This is the entire so social post. I categorize them. If there are videos, I tagged it, and all the social metrics. So I have all of this in there now post topics, the type of post, all the metrics. Now, when I upload that to ChatGPT, I tell it it's an expert at analyzing social media data. I'm giving you a year's worth of LinkedIn performance, which topics get the most follower growth per post, per engagement, per impression, because I have it organized by topics. It starts to crunch through the data and comes back and, and quickly finds the correlations. Now I want it to make a chart for me because maybe I have a meeting I'm going to. Draw me a heat map matrix showing the normalized, that's an important word, average impressions, average engagements, and average number of comments, and average reposts and new followers for each topic category. And it did it. These are the topics I talk about on LinkedIn. These are all the social metrics. And you can see some topics grow my following faster than others. Other topics get lots of impressions and engagement. 
it's, but they're not even the same topics. I'm, I was very surprised. The topics that in my, in, in this data set, and it's kind of a lot of data, actually, it's a whole year of social data uh, for a very, very active account. Uh, the things that grow my following are not the things that get lots of comments and shares. Fascinating. Uh, other analysis, what three word trigrams appear in the top performing posts? This is part of the magic, right? It's the little words, that combination of words. If you never thought of asking, you know, what three word trigrams correlate with success, now you have, you know, here's the idea. Uh, it comes back with some, some useful, some not. Uh, how does word count, number of characters? How do emojis correlate with performance? Do a semantic distance analysis and tell me which subtopics are are not represented. What things do I fail to talk about, but almost but talk about all the adjacent things when that would work well? Using the topics and tone, uh, write a post that is likely to drive high engagement. Summarize the write a content strategy based on that data set. You know, it, it, uh, it maybe it's maybe it's a surprise. Maybe there's a surprise in there. And then, so if you liked that, I want to suggest one final uh, step in AI that's quite useful. Uh, it's to sort of institutionalize that process you just went through or be able to share that easily with the team or be able to do that again later. Create a prompt that can work as a style guide and that can be given to ChatGPT so AI can effectively write future posts in the same voice, tone, and style. So I asked it for a style guide prompt, which it did. It wrote basically like a style guide prompt that I could then use. This whole thing would be used as sub in, in subsequent prompts, right? I'd give it this, make it a PDF and upload it every time from then after. And then I'm going to go add that to my shared prompt library. If you work on a team, this is very early step in AI adoption, create a library of shared prompts so that are approved and you vetted and know to be useful that you can share, that you can send to your team. This is what I called mine the codex because uh, it sounded cool. I think Spellbook is almost like, this is like some Hogwarts stuff here, right? Expectus prompticus, like you, anyone that has this prompt can like do this magic trick, right? And it will give, it'll find gaps in content or, you know, create an outline or, you know, document a quick persona for something if you're an agency. So all of these are vetted and uh, this screenshot's a little bit old. I've updated these many times. Uh, I'm in here four or five times a day. So another uh, social media trick uh, is to give it a thing and ask for what the most provocative part of that is. This kind of goes with that earlier thought leadership hack. Um, I was on a podcast with Chris Carr and Paul Ratzer. Uh, it was an AI thing because that's just kind of sticking with our topic here. And uh, some it, it was a long conversation, but there were parts of it that were funny and parts that were provocative. There is a place here where I can just click to grab the transcript and copy and paste that and export that out of there. And then... Um, ask it to suggest articles based on that transcript, and it will come up with some general ideas. Some of those are good, but this prompt I loved even more. Which statements in this video are people most likely to be surprised by? Which soundbite would make the best video clip for social media? It, so it's very hard to analyze. Like these transcripts are hard to work with. If you ever mm -hmm. tried to write an article from a video transcript, it's murder. Like these are huge it's like the opposite of digital content best practices it's like massive blocky paragraphs someone monologue like i'm doing now like the transcript for this would be all, would be a nightmare to turn into a post uh but, but ai could do a good job of that or you could give it a, a whole series of posts right like your elbow if you'd have a podcast put in all those podcast transcripts and just ask it to find 10 effective sound bites grab those go back to the videos capture that as a little you know pithy uh so, short form video that you could use you can imagine all the things that could be done. So this is basically breaking out like line by line what the surprising statements are, what the potential sound bites are. Um, Matt, we're getting, we're we're gonna end on time. Sir, should I take a breath? How are you doing? <laughs> you know, it's funny. You shared some of the feedback that you had from social media marketing world, and a couple of people said like you talk really fast, um, I and I have the same problem slash superpower. Uh, so I think, um, this is recorded. Obviously we can do transcript of this. We can AI the crap out of all this content as well. But for those of you watching, you can, you'll get the recording. You can rewatch this at half the speed 
uh, to be able to pick up a lot of this. But just uh, I'm keeping track of a number of questions that had come up. So let's cool. keep going, and then I'll get back to some of those questions make sure we cover it from everybody. So if you still have a question for Andy, please throw it in the chat. I'll, I'll note that, and we'll get back to him. And you want to leave like 10, 15 minutes? Is you, you, um, I can kind of calibrate this here. I'll just keep going, and then we'll wrap yeah. in a bit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think uh, if you have permission and your legal, uh, your general counsel or your legal agreements allow for it, or you're just using your own data and you're not concerned, this is actually one of my favorite things to do with AI. If I only did two things in this deck, I'd say, you know, build personas before you do anything else related to content or conversion. And then, you know, uh, consider giving AI data and having it find correlations, which are really sort of hard to do otherwise. So these are screenshots that you can just follow. Just click where this says to click in your analytics. Like I said, I'm kind of a GA4 nerd. Um, this is the pages and screens report. If you customize it to put those metrics in, these are my favorite metrics, traffic, engagement, uh, conversion. And then uh, it, you've got a secondary dimension and, at, and make the first column page title. And you've got these sort of the title of every one of your articles, and you've got where they where the visitor came from and what happened after the visitor landed. That's a bunch of data. Um, uh, and it's kind of hard to be hard to do analysis from this. I've got now I'm going to filter to show only blog posts. And I'm going to export that. I've now I've got a file that has all the performance of all of my blog posts from uh, broken down by the channel from which the visitor came. And it's mostly good data. You just delete those top nine rows. Every time you export data from Google Analytics, delete those top nine rows. It's annoying. It's like a comment. AI kind of chokes on it. You have to. It's better to remove it manually, and then upload it. And a cleanup prompt. You know, these are title tags, and they've got the brand at the end. So remove the brand. Remove rows with very low traffic. And then anytime you ask it to do any any editing of a of a data set, you provide link to download. You have to put provide link to download because it might make a mistake and remove all the data and it's doing trying to do analysis on four rows and you didn't even notice it for 20 minutes. So uh, I click to provide link to download. I check the file. Does the file look good? This is fine. Now that I can start having, uh, now the kind of data analysis party begins. You're a content strategist skilled at using GA4 to do find insights. I'm giving you an export from a blog. It has title tags. Infer topics from the title tags analyze performance of topics across sources, make content marketing recommendations to drive greater traffic and conversions. So because it had the title tag in, as the URL, instead of the URLs, it can infer topics from that. And it starts to make recommendations uh, that aren't bad. Let's go deeper. Recommend five new articles based on the data set. For each, create two draft headlines and, how to, uh, and uh, suggestions on how to promote that content. These are not bad. These are actually things that I think I could have easily written had I thought about it. Uh, it's got topics and headlines and promotion ideas. That's what I would hope to get from a content strategist if I sat next to a human and talked to them. Uh, and it's just the beginning. What titles are the most? What are the titles of the most engaging articles have in common? Find correlations between topics and traffic sources. Suggest ten articles based on the data. Divide them in groups. Good for search. Good for social. Which top? Which of these articles is most um, likely to have the best performance? Uh, write an outline for that article. The outline should work well, and then give it all your best practices. Uh, so this is just a tiny, like high-level view of how you can just take the performance of everything you've done in a sort of a big, messy format, right? Just like all the data, and have it process it, and it can come back and do a pretty good job. Number nine, uh, Matt, we did a version of this on a CMO Coffee Talk uh, yeah. a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to step back and focus on the money pages. We've been talking most about content marketing. Uh, you'll actually get better results faster by focusing on those conversion-focused pages, those pages designed to sell, the pages that emulate a sales conversation. Work with Heinz and they'll teach you. These, the job is to align with that, that persona, that target target audience in their moment of truth, right? If there's an un, unmet, uh, unaddressed objection there, or you know, if the topic's kind of off, uh, that's not gonna work. So part of what I've gotten from Heinz is like better alignment and looking cl more closely at my pages to confirm like, what's, what does this person really need? 
this is way closer to the bottom of the funnel than all of your blog articles. So I'm going to do that with this one of the space company things. It's a bad page. It's a short page. It's poorly formatted. It's kind of not even good legibility. It doesn't rank high, doesn't support any of its assertion with, with evidence. We could all make this a better page. Just all everyone on this call knows what to do with this. But let's use AI anyway, just for fun. Review the page. How does it align and not align with the persona's information needs? That's magic. How does it align and not align? So yeah, it has the persona and it has the page, right? I took the page, by the way, that was a, a full page screenshot. This Chrome extensions that will just capture an entire page. Mine is called Go Full Page. It's like a free Chrome extension. I'm frequently exporting screenshots of web pages, giving it to the AI after it's been trained on the persona and say, what's missing? And it, it's not it's not a bad job. It comes back and says, like, what is, how does it align? And how does it not align? Mm -hmm. What is missing from this page? That's really hard for a human brain to do. Right? It takes years, decades of strategy experience to look at an asset and say, what's missing? from this case study or web page or social post or report or you know PPC ad or whatever it is, like what's missing, right? Like Jay Schwendelson last night was what's missing from these subject lines. So those are obvious gaps. Take it or leave it. It's just a perspective. Uh, a lot of what I like to do with AI is have it find gaps because human brains are hard at that. It's the availability heuristic. We overvalue things we can see. It's a cognitive bias built into all of our brains. It's really hard for us to see things, to identify things that, that are missing. Uh, in this one, I asked it to write an outline to that page to better align with needs. Again, I don't have it write anything. I might have it write an outline and look at that outline. The outline is actually pretty good. Like uh, it's asking for evidence and details and benefits, uh, uh, emphasizing things that were missing according to the persona's needs. To do this, you can copy and without a paid account, just ChatGPT, the free version of ChatGPT. You can just copy and paste the text. Uh, if you grab a full page screenshot, it will look at the pictures and sort of understand things that weren't in the text. Uh, you can also export, just go to file, save, and save the HTML and upload the HTML file if you have ChatGPT Plus. And that's going to uh, include some elements that are good for evaluating SEO, like uh, title tags and meta descriptions, which are technically not on the page. Uh, that kind of gap analysis is possible even in larger formats. Uh, this is the book. I'm working on an update for it now. Uh, Lisa and I were just talking like I, the, the, it doesn't have any like the GA4 and AI and to keep adding. So um, even though this person said the best book ever, most comprehensive, is it the most comprehensive? I gave I gave it to AI and said, what are the most important topics that are not covered in this book? So fun. Comes back and tells me all the topics that it did not cover. That's really hard to do. It did in two seconds, right? It's like, and I... I knowingly skip these topics. They're not passions of mine, or they're not anything that, you know, ethics and personalization. These aren't like main topics for me and my strategy. But um, I thought that was really interesting. Go ahead and make a make a version of anything and upload it, and just ask what's not there. Uh, there's another mini section in here about competitive analysis. You can give it two pages and say what's how are they? What's the difference? My page, my competitor's page. What did we cover? What didn't? What didn't? What did neither of us cover? And all of this is based on the prioritized information needs of the persona. Garbage in, garbage out. We assume that persona, I'm always assuming here the persona was accurate. You can give it a bunch of pages. This almost shows you the difference in brand positioning between you and your competitors. I've got four pages in here, me and three competitors. And I have it draw a heat map showing the extent to which they covered these topics. So interesting, right? It's like, if you didn't cover it, are you? did you mean to miss that? Right? These are aligned with the persona's information needs. And then, um, uh, as always, Matt, no surprise, I've got like SEO prompts in here, how to get it to make recommendations to pages um, based on search. It's like, uh, I, um, I again, we'll share the deck. Mm -hmm. But these are things where it's coming back and making recommendations to edit pages to improve both search and conversion opportunities. So this is uh, after going through a series of steps, which I just skipped, but you'll have, uh, you can see how I'm getting it to try to identify uh, la missing information needs according to my audience and keyword opportunities according to uh, Google. Um, so yeah, there are, um, uh, I suggest maybe we slow down here now. Uh, I'll, do, I'll share one other thing. Uh, this is 
these are the different types of evidence you can add to web pages. Uh, this is my list, my mental list after having done, you know, website planning and conversion optimization for since 2001. Uh, if you give this prompt to a, and give it a web page and tell it you're a conversion optimization expert, I'm almost squeamish about sharing some of these. This is like, let's not, don't, please don't share this stuff too much, people. We'll keep this just in our little group here. This one's just for us on this webinar, okay? We don't tell, we're gonna just hold this one close. The following are various types of evidence that can be added to web pages. Testimonials, case studies, success stories, awards, years of business, size of operation, number of products, happy customers, best sellers. Rate the uploaded page in its use of supportive evidence and show your thinking. And it basically comes back and tells you, like, what are all of your unsupported claims? Mm -hmm. It basically giving you a list of every unsupported marketing claim you made on any page. So what I've done here today is I took a set of best practices and then I turned that into a prompt to audit something that exists or to draft a new version of something. But I have to first give it the persona and then give it best practices. So when my friend sent me his best practices for e-commerce product detail pages, I turned it into a very, I, half an hour later, reading 148 pages, I converted that into an outline and that became the prompt. Product detail pages should have these things, these images, these you know calls to action talk about shipping and then in the end what i'm what i'm going to have it do is you know i'm giving you a page provide a detailed audit or i'm giving you a de uh, create a draft for a new page i'm giving you the product data so uh, that combination start with the persona take your best practices and what you know to be effective in your you know career as a pro and make that the prompt and then have, and then ask it to evaluate something super useful gap analysis or uh, to give you a draft for something new. And then, you know, use all your, you know, use your own uh, strategic thinking to uh, apply that or, you know, ignore the garbage and, and, and take the jewels and um, polish that up or create something new. So um, that, uh, Matt, I'm ready to, to just pause. Uh, and take a breath and see how we're doing. Maybe I can stop the share and we'll have a conversation. Yeah, so amazing. Uh, some questions that I wanna make sure we get to. First of all, um, there are prompt limits, right? On GPT-4 plus Claude. Did you not hit that with uploading an entire book? Like how did you get around that? Or it, what, was there no limit for that? Uh, I forgot it's like 30,000 language tokens or something. I don't know that I'm not technical. Um, but that it worked. I mean, if the book I made it into a text file, so .txt, mm -hmm. so it, it it took that the vast majority of the total file size came out as soon as I exported it as a text file. Um, but no, I haven't hit the limit yet. Okay, um, have you? I mean, so just a couple months ago, it was like Chat GPT four and plus that was kind of it. Now Gemini is doing a pretty good job. Um, Claude, you've got Perplexity, you've got Copilot from Microsoft. Any sort of opinions or stack rank on some of these, knowing that they're going to continue to evolve and change? Uh, you know, Lisa told me about something called chathub.gg that can make a grid and check them and, and do at the same. You write one prompt and it puts them into all the tools and it's like a big API kind of mashup. Uh, you could test it for yourself. Uh, I have not, I'm not well suited to answer that. I use perplexity for fun and for all the time. I think it's a fantastic alternative to Google. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, AI will replace a lot of, the the cert the the use cases for for Google search, um, but no, I'm really just trying to keep it vanilla because it's easy to teach and everyone here knows it. So speaking of search, um, what are your thoughts at this point on sort of SGE coming from Google, the search generative experience um, in beta now appearing in some places? There's expectations of some pretty dramatic declines in natural search traffic for some people based on that. But just curious, what you see there. Uh, Gartner recently predicted a 25% drop in total global search volume. That doesn't sound unreasonable to me because as people realize just how much easier and cleaner and faster and private, uh, lightweight, uh, you know, the AI experience is to give you quick answers, then uh, user behavior will shift. But mm -hmm. I said quick answers I'm, for the, for the information intent queries, right? A lot of that I think will move like, how tall is Bradley Cooper? Nobody ever should have made money on that, right? It's a waste, like that person just wants a few numbers. 
how to make your guac how to make guacamole i made a video side by side showing um chat gpt and google with websites and ads and videos and you know the no all the noise so i think that we're going to lose i think user behavior will shift and people will start using ai but mostly for very low intent very sort of uh not very valuable phrases so a lot of websites will lose traffic but the commercial intent phrases many of those are still have visit website intent and uh so it, i think that the um the bottom line impact to many brands who get traffic who get uh you know generate leads from search traffic uh is less at risk than the information and tech queries. I combined a couple of things you said earlier and it wasn't fair. I took it out of the, out of the chat. Cause I said, basically you said a lot of these things are really not really passions of mine. And then you mentioned ethics. And I said, great. Ethics, not a passion of mine says Andy Christina. <laughs> um, but like speaking of that, I think there's an ethical question or just ethic question or just general copyright IP around prompts. Like a lot of companies, a lot of individuals building prompt libraries. People say, Oh, can I see your prompts? Can I see your prompts? Can I have access to yeah. that? Like, do you have it? Are there any, like, what's the ethics or what's the etiquette you think that is emerging yeah. around prompt libraries? Well, accuracy and bias, I, I've successfully avoided here mostly by not having it do anything but give me ideas and researching and uploading data. So I, um, and I'm taking it all with a grain of salt anyway, as I said a hundred times. Uh, the, what you just said is actually one of the most interesting parts. And I, I am fascinated by this because I've heard that people are signing employment agreements when they get hired somewhere saying that they will not share, disclose any of the prompts that they've learned or create on that job. Wow. That's like, people are going to sign that. That's antithetical to my, my, my ethos because I am a content marketer and I have always believed content marketing is a contest of generosity and the brand that gives away the most helpful, useful advice wins the most loyalty and love and leads. So, uh, I'm sharing everything still, but I have had moments. I, I mentioned that today, like some of these prompts, I'm like, Wow, you know, as soon as someone has this prompt, they can basically do what it took me a long time to learn. Mm -hmm. um, they can get you know eighty percent of that in ten seconds. Uh, but hey, that's um, you know we're all a bit disrupted here, and uh, I choose to just stay on the side of transparency and openness. Yeah, I, I, we we literally have that conversation internally as well, saying you know we're using AI and tools and prompts and uh, templates to sort of get some of our work done, and we're like, wow, if we let if we let that go, does that dilute what we do? I'm like, well, parts of it, you know, in the same way that like my first job at a PR firm years ago was I was an I was an intern and I had to write like uh, briefing books for press tours. Like you don't have to, you don't need an intern or anybody to write that anymore. But there's still PR firms, there's still people doing PR, right? And so the job. Mm -hmm. The, the tasks and the job, I think, changes over time. Derek had a really good question early on. Like, I mean, you did a great job of sort of showing how you were, you know, over time progressively training and teaching the GPT. At what point do you stop using GPT to edit? And when do you start editing it yourself? Is there is there a line or is there things you're looking for that tell me, okay, I need to take this off, quote unquote, autopilot and do it myself? Yeah, uh, because it's the easiest way to show. This is my, uh, I, I skipped this, but do I use it to create personas? Yes. Topic research? Sometimes. Content mission statements? No. I don't need it for that. Thought leadership? It's not really in my content strategy anyway. I don't use it for outlines or briefs. I don't use it for first drafts. I love analyzing data with it. Creating promotional assets? I don't need to write another YouTube description anymore. I'm, I can be done with that. Auditing sales pages? Heck yeah. I can't see gaps as well as it can. Competitive analysis, super fun. I don't need that every day, but it's fun. I like the, how it does recommendations for SEO and the conversion review is useful. That's me. Use, choose your own adventure and <laughs> whatever you like to do. It's it's a person. It's a it's our jobs to decide what we want. You know where we want to add value. Um, the more strategic things that we do, probably the more secure we are in our roles. So we got just a couple minutes before the top of the hour. Um, just first of all, thank you, Andy. I mean, you'll hopefully you'll get the chance to go through the chat later, but um, a couple people gave versions of like, this is the most pragmatic, useful webinar I've been to in a long time. And so oh. since I'm producing and I take credit for that, um, and Heinz Marketing is going to take credit for that, but the content's all you. So I kid. I told you that I was here for comic effect. So um, but in all seriousness, I think my last question is just around, I think the existential dread a lot of people have around AI. 
right? I mean, depending on who you listen to and depending on what they foresee, like my job's going to be gone and I'm not going to, I mean, so you start to think about replacing my job and people start worrying about how they're going to pay their mortgage and pay their bills. Um, I think on the other side, like there's things that are human. There's things that we do with our knowledge and experience and things that continue to change in the world that AI doesn't know, does won't know. I mean, who knows what the future is going to look like? Someone mentioned in the comment earlier, we're really bad as humans of predicting the future, even if we have better data. Kind of where are you at sitting here, you know, end of March 2024, where you think this is going to go and um, how we how we prepare? Yeah, I mean, uh, Paul Reitzer's quote is uh, apropos. It's, he says, uh, AI will not replace marketers, but marketers who use AI will replace marketers who don't use AI. Uh, Chris Penn pluralizes it. He says, a single marketer who uses AI will replace several marketers who don't use AI. Uh, is that alarming? Does that worry me? Uh, in the end, I mean, I, I've been, I, I worked in restaurants for 10 years, starting from when I was 15 years old. People like service. Make people feel special. Take care of the people around you. Be helpful. Use, use whatever tools. There's always been tools. There's tools there all the time, right? We're all disrupted all the time. But I think that if, um, you know, there's still... Uh, more demand than ever for human connections. You know, the, 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 the things that humans are best at, AI can't come close. Uh, so I think that, um, you know, if we just stay focused on our audience's needs and just relentlessly, you know, uh, try to service these people around us because we care, that uh, there'll always be a role for us. Um, you know, but we do have to adapt, no question. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. All right. Well, thank you, everyone who uh, joined us live today and stuck around with us for the full hour. Um, we are going to follow up with you all with a copy of Andy's deck with a recording of this session. Uh, I did. We'll probably AI the crap out of this, as I mentioned earlier, and sort of have some fun with the content and highlight different sort of different things. But uh, Andy, you're the best. Thank you so much for your generosity and just for how much you not only sort of dig in on this stuff, but I mean, I think, you know, those of us that are sort of trying to read and learn a lot about AI, there's a lot of so so-called experts out there. There's a lot of people spouting on different things. And I think this is so such a great way of making it practical, pragmatic, and helping people sort of really get in. And I think the best way for any of us to learn AI and to get good at it is just to get our hands dirty and to go and do this and like tons of uh, places for people to go and start practicing based on this. So thank you. Thank you, Matt. And thank you. Uh, thanks to Heinz Marketing for everything Heinz is doing for Orbit Media. And uh, this is, you know, just one more chapter in a long, happy partnership. Absolutely. Well, thanks again, everyone, for attending. Uh, keep an eye on your feeds from us for our next webinar in our series of, of uh, events like this. And uh, have a great rest of your day. Great finish to the month and quarter. And um, we'll see you all soon. Take care. Bye-bye.